Hola, muy buenos días a todos los participantes. Good morning, everyone. Eh, this is just a few instructions about the caption. Estas son algunas instrucciones para activar eh, el traductor. Pueden en la parte superior eh, darle clic, ah, perdón, en la parte inferior darle clic a mostrar eh, captions o mostrar traducción y ahí pueden escoger eh, la, el idioma de su preferencia. Eh, tenemos disponibilidad para diferentes idiomas, entonces para su mayor facilidad. Esta es una opción que se habilita en este webinar para poder tener esta conversación. Gracias. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I am Dori Mitros Durham, and on behalf of the CLOW Institute for Civil and Human Rights and our colleagues at the Nanovic Institute for European Studies here at the University of Notre Dame, I'm delighted to welcome you to our flash panel, Unlocking Potential, International Perspectives on Education in Prison. Our moderator today is Justin McDevitt. Justin is currently the Assistant Director for Alumni Relations and Career Development for the Moreau College Initiative, a college and prison program at Westville, Indiana Correctional Facility, administered through Holy Cross College in partnership with the Bard Prison Initiative and the University of Notre Dame. He teaches classes on global migration, pandemics and society, Christian Muslim relations, racism in American politics, public speaking, and the senior capstone and internship courses, as well as a required freshman seminar. Justin received his MA in political science from the University of Notre Dame, go Irish, and his JD from Loyola University in Chicago. His main areas of interest are comparative politics and religion and comparative judicial politics. During law school, he served as a law clerk for the Legal Assistance Foundation of Metropolitan Chicago and for the Illinois Migrant Legal Assistance Project. He also worked as a judicial extern for Federal Magistrate Judge Honorable Michael T. Mason and Cook County Judge Honorable Mary Ann Ma Mason, excuse me. Justin is the co-editor of an upcoming volume from Brandeis University Press on education in prison globally, and is the author of several book chapters and law review articles, including Compromise is Complicity, Why There is No Middle Road in the Struggle to Protect Day Laborers in the United States. That piece won the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers Annual Law Student Writing Competition and was published in the ABA Journal of Labor and Employment Law. Justin, thank you so much. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, um, for hosting us, Clow Institute and the Native Institute and Center for Social Concerns. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with everyone today. Um, I have the, um, the great honor of introducing our panelists, but first, I want to frame the conversation a little bit um, before we turn it over to the panelists. Um, this book, um, or this panel, is stems from the work that we did on the upcoming book that um, Dory mentioned. Um, and the title of the book is actually Unlocking Potential International Perspectives on Education in Prison. Um, this, uh, the book will be, is in, in um, production right now and will be released um, from Brandeis University Press um, in January, I believe. So coming up soon, and, uh, but as um, all these projects are, this is um, a labor that has taken years to, um, to move forward. And it's a real honor to be able to come here and, and talk about this project that has been in the works for so long and a labor of love. Um, let me begin by um, reading an excerpt from the book that sort of frames the conversation that we're gonna have today. And it's, it's a very important one. Um, for people serving prison sentences, educational access provides a sense of meaning within prison that allows for a degree of dignity and autonomy in an otherwise bleak landscape. Such a reality is not meant to justify the use of extended sentences commonly issued in the United States, for example, but it rather points to the fact that educational access brings a range of positive outcomes for incarcerated people, regardless of sentence length or specific circumstances. And in truth, even correctional administrators acknowledge the power of participation in academic programming as another way to measure reintegration for incarcerated people. But despite the acknowledged benefits to, to educational access in prison, expanding such access requires navigating a host of bureaucratic and political barriers. Following a confluence of factors, including the global spread of COVID-19, renewed scrutiny of criminal justice systems stemming from racial justice protests, and the restoration of access to Pell Grants for incarcerated individuals in the United States, carceral systems have increasingly been part of public conversations about equality in its many forms. Prisons and jails, as well as the programs providing educational access for the people incarcerated in them, have received more public attention in the past few years as both individuals and institutions struggle to reconcile structural justice with public safety. 
and challenges to carceral interve inter interventions abound. On the international horizon, which is represented here today, ongoing immigration from areas facing increased insecurity, such as Syria, Central America, and elsewhere in the global south, continue to bring up questions about the criminalization of immigration. We'll hear a little bit about, more about that later. The immigration crisis for Ukrainians fleeing Russian attacks has also shed light on the racial factors at play in the crimigration, the criminalization of immigration of black, indigenous, and people of color, refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. More broadly, incarceration as a supposed public safety tool is pushing many states in the US to consider what the purpose of prison truly is. That's part of the ongoing conversation. So as a result of these and many other factors, the focus on the human rights and dignity of the people who are incarcerated around the world has become more salient than ever. And there's a growing need for vital and expanding dialogues on the role of education and public safety and justice systems worldwide. So with that framing, let me introduce our panelists and then I'll turn it over to them for um, the panelists here will um, speak on the topic that they wrote in their chapter uh, in our book and um, they're, they have in incredible things to share. So this, the order I introduce is the order that the panelists will speak. Um, I'll introduce them all at the beginning, but I'll usher them um, in and out of the conversation as we go along. So first, Jennifer Piraeus is the coordinator and co-founder of the program Literacy for Reconciliation or Contextos in El Salvador and Chicago. She holds degrees in English as a second language and applied linguistics from El Salvador and received her master's degree in English from Middlebury College in 2018. Her work extends from curriculum development, teaching, advocacy, training, and facilitating spaces of dialogue. She has led the work and the vision for Contextos work in prisons and communities, accompanied authors in their journeys of self-discovery, and brought their stories to hundreds of teachers, psychologists, and social workers in professional development spaces. She has been recognized with numerous fellowships and scholarships, such as the Rocky Gooch Memorial Scholarship and the Esperanza Fellowship. And second, um, co-editor of the volume um, and co-author of the introduction and conclusion, Manisha Gelman is Associate Professor of Political Science in the Marlboro Institute for Liberal Arts and, Interdis and Interdisciplinary Studies at Emerson College. She is the founder and director of the Emerson Prison Initiative, which brings a BA pathway to incarcerated students at state prisons in Massachusetts. Gelman is the editor of Education Behind the Wall, How, Why and How We Teach College in Prison, which was published last year. Gelman is also the author of Indigenous Language Politics in the Schoolroom, Cultural Survival in Mexico and the United States, and Dem Democratization and Memories of Violence, Ethnic Minority Social Movements in Mexico, Turkey, and El Salvador. She has published widely in both academic journals and popular outlets on a range of issues having to do with democracy and human rights, Gelman serves as an expert witness in asylum cases in U.S. immigration courts for people from Mexico and El Salvador. And third up, we have Lisa Ernest Jones. She's a professor at the Institute of Psychosocial Science at the University of Bergen in Norway. She has published books, chapters, and journal articles on topics such as reading and writing difficulties and efficacy beliefs among people in prison, special education in schools, and educational technology use in schools. Over the last few years, Dr. Jones and her colleagues in the Bergen Cognition and Learning Group have conducted several large-scale studies in Norwegian and Nordic prisons. And final panelist is Massimiliano Skirinci. He's an English lecturer in the Department of Psychology, Educational Science, and Human Movement at the University of Palermo in Italy. He is a teacher of Italian, a linguistic and cultural mediator, and an oral examiner University for Foreigners of Perugia in, Ital in Italy. He is also the co-author of the book, In Partenza, An Introduction to Italian, and co-author of the articles, Immigrant, Immigrant Prisoners in Italy, Cultural Mediation to Reduce Social Isolation and Increase Prisoner Migrant Wellbeing, um, and Reversing the Trend, a Psychosocial Intervention on Young Immigrants in Sicily. So we're, we'll turn it over to our first panelist now, Jennifer Correas, um, will speak to us first. Thank you, Justin. Hello, everyone, once one more time. My name is Jennifer, and I'm happy to be presenting today uh, as a contributor to this wonderful book. Um, I'm going to do like a slight uh, description of my chapter, and, and then I'm going to show you also some of the writings that 
of the authors that we work with here in El Salvador. So my chapter is divided in different sections. I, I, before I, the beginning of my work with prisons was teaching, and that's also the core and the heart of this chapter, how teaching is transformative and also education itself, it opens doors to not only opportunities on the outside, but also opportunities to self-discovery and community development. So I, my chapter starts, starts by talking about the lives of the authors that we work with. I think from the beginning, language and, and words, uh, we knew they were very important to set the tone of the project, to set the tone of the work that we wanted to do. So we never call them students. We never call them inmates. We never call them any of those names. We decided that the first day that you walk into a classroom uh, with us, you, you, you were going to be named author and you had to develop that identity, what it means to you to be an author, not only in the literal sense of writing your own story, but also what it means to take charge of your lives once again in a very ironic way, because while incarcerated, that's the last thing that you have a chance to decide for your own life. So the idea of being author, it means that you go back to that sense of ownership of your own life and decisions. So I first talk about two different types of authors, let's say, the authors, the young authors, and also the adult authors, and how they are very much alike, and they resemble one another. Um, one of them speaks about the other in the future tense, and the other one speaks to the other in the past tense, which really says a lot about our history in El Salvador and the way that cycles of violence continue to happen, regardless um, of um, the public discourse. The next chapter has to do with uh, giving a general context of El Salvador. Uh, I think it's very well known. Our history has been uh, very rooted into violence and punitivism and mano dura. So giving a brief uh, summary, uh, that's, I guess that's a better way to say it, of our history in El Salvador and the repeatedly ways in which the state has thought of creating more secure environments by applying um, punitive strategies uh, throughout the history of our country and how it's really easy to see actually how different patterns in the way that we think about violence continue to repeat themselves as of now too. So that's uh, the second section of my chapter. And the third section has to do more about the work with contextos or the work that we do in contextos and how for us, we we didn't we didn't want to we didn't necessarily wanted to go to prisons. It was something. It wasn't something that was in our mission in the first place. Our mission has also always been uh, rooted into education and critical thinking and radical imagination. And we started working in communities and schools. However, when kids were writing in their school settings, they were writing about their family members being incarcerated. They were writing about family members going uh, to the US uh, doing the migration route. So they were telling us all of the stories who, the, all of the stories that we were missing that other piece. We were missing the other stories of the ones that left. We were missing the stories of the people that were incarcerated. So our first, uh, our first time in, in prison had to do with hearing the voices of the communities and knowing where those answers were. So that led us to believe and to understand, better said, to understand that prison community and schools are not isolated uh, institutions or isolated spaces. They are much more connected than we thought, than we think of. So when working in prison, we are impacting the schools, we are impacting the communities and the other way around. So it is not just about one thing or the other. My next chapter has to do, it's, uh, I love this title, it's called, the ones that love the most. And I don't, I don't think anybody will necessarily agree with me that the one that love the most are the ones, the workers of the detention centers and prisons. I know that like, it doesn't look like, <laughs> it doesn't look like they love the most. Uh, however, I think they do. And, and, and the idea of it has to do with how our work uh, transcended from just giving creative writing classes in detention centers or prisons it, we realized that we wanted to, to be part of a, 
a system transformation. So we had to start working on trainings for the staff, trainings to the management to, to, to make much more sustainable um, spaces and sustainable changes than rather working just with this with, with the with the authors inside. So that chapter explores the different ways in, into how an educational program can be lifted into a much more systemic work. Um, after that, I talk about the dynamics of collective writing and the way that identity can be also transformed in that sense, and also about the way that uh, collective writing and writing itself become a, a tools of transformation, uh, not only for their for themselves but also for their communities. Um, there is a, a sense of a, or there is a big phenomenon of gang affiliation, uh, which is something worth exploring through writing and um, going through the myth of what writing and what that identity means. So I want to end. I'm about to 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 go off, but I want to. What I want to show you briefly is some of the writings of these of these authors and the way that they present themselves to the world. It, it's very different sometimes from the way that we that we think about them. So I want to show you a brief a brief excerpt from one of those writings. All right, so I'm going to read it in Spanish and also in English. Um, this is one of our authors. This is a, um, a young author in one of the detention centers at the time. And this is one of the, 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 the things that he wrote and published in his book. Um, en unos segundos, mi vida dio un gran cambio. Para mí ha sido la decisión más difícil. Saber que he tirado tantas rocas al río sin darme cuenta de las circunstancias o el mal que he ocasionado. Cosas que jamás podré enmendar. In those seconds of my life took a big change. For me, it's been the most difficult decision to know that I've thrown so many rocks into the river without realizing the circumstances, the evil that I've caused, things that I will never be able to make amends for. We can see in the writing, some of them talk about amendments, some of them talk about reparation, some others talk about the birthday of their kid. They, they choose what to write and they choose where the writing who the audience is to be able to uh, to express in that way. Um, you can find all these books. We have over a thousand publications, not only here in El Salvador, but also in Chicago uh, of authors that have written and that have published their their writings into this format. Um, then again, some of them talk about what it means to be incarcerated, but some others just talk about having a great birthday or falling in love things that we wouldn't necessarily think about when we approach a book knowing that that person is incarcerated. In fact, that's the way that I told my mom that I work in prisons by showing her some of the writings of the books and of, of the authors. And she was very surprised to know that she, was, she, she felt very connected to it in ways that she didn't think of. You can find all these books uh, available online. This is the, our digital the repository. Uh, most of them are, some of them are translated into English and Spanish. We have used them. Uh, for instance, we launched this project in Cook County Jail by, in Chicago a couple of years ago. And we translated some of the books to be presented as, as the face of the project. And we use them all the time to have conversations and dialogues among different uh, sectors of society. So. Very pleased to be here. Thank you so much for, for, for being here and also for, for allowing us to share our experience here in El Salvador. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, next, we'll hear from Misha Gelman, who is um, co-editor of the, the book as well. And we'll um, talk about, about her experience as director of a program and um, about the themes of the book as well. Manisha. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you. And it's really a delight to get to bring together some of the authors uh, from this book. And it's been such a pleasure working with Justin as co-editor in, in taking this idea and making it a reality. 
So Ju Justin read a bit of my bio and I just I want to take my first few minutes and just talk a little bit more about my direct role as the founding director of the Emerson Prison Initiative and talk about the work that we do and then touch on a couple ways that I see educational access in prison as really connected to human rights because for me that's that is a fundamental framework that I employ when I talk about this kind of work. So the my program, which is based at Emerson College in Boston, brings a bachelor's degree pathway for people who are incarcerated in now in two state prisons in the state of Massachusetts. And we started with a credit bearing program in 2017, and we just had our first graduation in 2022, where we had eight people complete the bachelor's degree in media, literature, and culture. And we now have a second cohort of students who are just about halfway through their degree, we're getting ready for another admissions cycle in the coming year. So we're, we are constantly bringing and supporting faculty and tutors to come into the prison and offer as parallel as possible the same curriculum that students on our traditional free campus have access to. And it's it's been just profound work both for the students and also for the faculty who uh, really appreciate the things that they learn about themselves in the teaching experience. Um, I've been doing work intervening in <laughs> carceral spaces for the last 25 years or so. I'm a long-term volunteer in lots of different kinds of uh, education in prison, creative writing in prison programs across uh, New York, California, and now in Massachusetts. And so the the first book that Justin mentioned that I edited, Education Behind the Wall, is really focused in the United States con uh, context, looking at uh, a variety of angles in terms of the impact of what it means to bring traditional liberal arts education into prison and the the impact that that has on students as well as as faculty and also the way that it impacts the traditional free campuses as well, the kinds of conversations that we have, the way we think about uh, being accessible to non-traditional learners in different ways, and what it means, for example, to extend library and research uh, privileges from a free campus into a carceral space. So it, by the by the end of that book, I think there was a sense, and this developed in conversations with with Justin and myself, that you know there's so much more to say here, and the experience of the United States for those of us who who live within its boundaries can feel so all consuming as a framework. And Justin and I are both comparativists <laughs> from our various traditions, and the idea of looking comparatively, using our skills as, as comparative social scientists to be able to better tease out what is working, what is broken, uh, what kind of lessons the international context can offer us was really a core goal, I think, for, for us as co-editors in this book. And and it's a wide range of cases that really show a spectrum of issues. Some of us are doing college, some like, like uh, Jennifer just described is doing not a for credit program, but something is that is absolutely impactful and transformational for the people that have access to that program. Um, one of the things that we did, I'll just lift up the terminology section of the book because it's a section that we grappled with and I like to talk about hard things, uh, are the kinds of choices. What does it mean to bring together this many different country case studies in one book? We use different language to talk about people who have experiences of incarceration. Some folks, because it's the norm in their uh, in their countries or because they're interacting with, with legal documents all the time, they're using words like uh, offenders or prisoners. Um, I don't use those terms. The Emerson Prison Initiative has a, a language guide where we really advocate for using person first language and talking talking about people with people who are incarcerated or people with carceral experiences, sometimes incarcerated students as shorthand. Um, but it was a very interesting conversation in and of itself to think about what it means to standardize language in talking about carceral experiences across <laughs> very disparate countries, very disparate case studies. Uh, similar conversations about the capitalization of the term white. This is something that is gaining momentum as part of the what's called the grammatical justice movement to try to not 
maintain and perpetuate whiteness as a default or a background setting, a norm where the small w allows a sort of normalization of whiteness while other races and ethnicities have capitalized terms. That wasn't a practice for, for many authors. And it was something that, you know, we had a lot of conversations about as editors, how do, how does, how do we use our power of standardization of language in the editing process itself to convey certain political ideas? These ideas are, are highly political, what we capitalize and what we don't. And so it was a very interesting space to uh, to be in conversation with Justin and the, the authors on that. And I hope that the kinds of terminological choices that we make in the book will also be taken up, will also be part of our contribution rather than just a background note or a footnote to the text. Because in some ways, I think that those terminological contributions are can be field shaping. They can be part of really shaping the way that we engage and do discourse about prison in the first place. So I'll use my my uh, handful of remaining minutes to just frame. I, I want to read an excerpt, if that's okay, from the conclusion, and I, I'll just read this paragraph, but recognize that it's it's a highly political claim that we're making, <laughs> and and then I'll say a few things about it. So quote. First and foremost, education is a fundamental right of all people, and people who are currently incarcerated are certainly no exception. As Article 26 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights makes clear, access to basic education should be free and universally provided in prison, while vocational training and higher education ought to be accessible as well. While some may argue that basic rights such as these should be suspended when someone is convicted of breaking the social contract by violating laws, we push back to say that a genuine vision of public safety must include access to the tools of transformation and self-actualization. In fact, if anything, the rights of people who are incarcerated must be safeguarded even more carefully than those of the general population as they are among the most vulnerable in society. And to truly make safer societies, we must interrupt ongoing structural injustices that exclude some people from access to living dignified lives. Educational access is one such intervention to this end. So I, I just want to comment that one of my personal goals in being involved in conversations about education in prison in its many forms is this connection to a human rights framework. And I think for me, I can't talk about what that relationship is without arriving at the realization that public safety, what it means to be safe in society, whether it's the United States or El Salvador or Norway or anywhere else, requires us to really look at the context of how, how we treat people who have transgressed social norms or broken laws. And until we find ways to ensure rehabilitation, to ensure educational access as something that changes people's circumstances when they leave prison, that, that we're really going to just end up with the same indicators of uh, the, the same indicators of community issues and uh, public insecurity as when we started. So I, I will just close by saying I hope that, uh, that we can all take time to think about what would a definition of public safety look like that truly keeps us safe, <laughs> not one that a that uses segregation, social segregation, and punitive punishment to uh, hide people away, <laughs> rather that rather than in a restorative sense, but also in an intervention in the fundamental creation of social hierarchy. How can education in in carceral spaces be part of reimagining a way to do public safety collectively? in many different kinds of states around the world so that we can be safe, not just ourselves, but, but everybody regardless of their particular identity or positionality. I know that that's a huge mandate to re-envision what that looks like, 
but I, I hope that some folks on this call will be inspired to uh, to think about that. And I really appreciate the authors who have done a, such a marvelous job articulating their own visions of what that can be. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manisha. Um, our next speaker is um, Lisa Jones from Norway. Um, Dr. Jones will speak about um, her experience and um, the chapter that they that she and her co-authors contributed, which is um, wonderful. And Dr. Jones, take it away. Oops, Dr. Jones, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. There we are. Yep, thank you. <laughs> yeah, hello, everybody. And together with my co-authors, Torten Langele, Terje Manger, Paul Breivik, and Arve Asbjørnsen um, at the University of Bergen and the County Governor of Hordaland, we would like to thank you, uh, Justin and Manisha, for uh, inviting us to contribute to this very important uh, volume. And I will give, I will show some uh, slides. Uh, just a second. Yeah. Uh, so in our uh, chapter in this uh, book, we uh, present an historical background and several unique uh, innovations. Uh, in prison education in Norway over the two last uh, decades. Um, so in this very short presentation, I will just give an overview of the Norwegian context and highlight some of the important research topics uh, we identify in this chapter and then also some implications of our uh, research. Just a little bit about the prison population in Norway. Uh, it's, a, it's a small population of about three and a half thousand uh, incarcerated people with an average age of 34 years. And um, about one, two thirds of the incarcerated persons uh, hold a Norwegian uh, citizenship. If I move forward to well, the prison education in Norway, uh, and as we've written in our chapter, as a Norway as a nation has been in the forefront regarding humane treatment of incarcerated citizens and the protection of their civil rights. Uh, and in Norway, incarcerated people, they have the same right to education as other citizens. And in uh, our correctional service, this means they have access to primary, lower secondary, and three years of upper secondary schooling, according to our educational uh, act. Uh, the three years of upper secondary schooling is a legal right uh, everybody has in our society, but it's not a mandatory uh, take. And the development of uh, education in prisons, uh, prisons in Norway, has been influenced by conventions and recommendations from Council of Europe and the EU, EU programs. Uh, and in our prisons in Norway, we have uh, educational programs in all prisons, and this has been since 2008. So in, in our book, we uh, report the latest um, numbers of education from our uh, studies, uh, as seen here, that the highest level of education among uh, incarcerated uh, people are about half, percent, half of them have secondary education. Uh, as their um, highest level, and one third roughly have upper secondary education, and one in five have completed some higher education, either as some uh, just a single subject or a or a degree. So, um, and now just move forward and look at um, some of our research, uh, which has been done from our research research group, Bergen Cognition and Learning Group, and we've had. Um, we could say three strands uh, with focus on number one and two uh, in this uh, chapter, in this uh, volume especially. So in the first, we are very, we have been focusing on the needs and the wishes for education among the incarcerated population in Norway. Uh, the second one, um, what challenges 
uh, do they face regarding education? Why do they continue education? What is their motivation? How are they motivated to start and continue education? And what barriers do they uh, meet in uh, when they do uh, take prison uh, education in prison? And furthermore, we also look into analysis of more vulnerable groups, also female uh, incarcerated, young incarcerated, foreign incarcerated. That is also in, in our research uh, focus. So with these three strands, we've been doing surveys, and this is also um, seen in, in our chapter where we go into our research and how our research has uh, developed and had effects on how the uh, educational offers are in correctional uh, service in, in Norway. So moreover, also, if we look at the implications of a research when we have been serving the um, the prison uh, the incarcerated population in Norway we have seen that we find when you do the research we do get a better coherence between what are the needs and the desires for education and then what pro programs are available early studies from our research group identified that the incarcerated people's needs and wishes were a lot of vocational training uh, earlier on and this was not um, in the prison education in Norway it was mainly more academic upper secondary education and these these systems have changed to to be more in line with the incarcerated people's needs and also uh, when we our research has also make uh, have done the also we had an increased awareness for how individual educational needs are for incarcerated adults. We have developed different survey uh, surveys and screening instruments for uh, identifying uh, their learning challenges. And moreover, also we've been working with uh, continuing higher education programs for teachers and policymakers in the field. So the knowledge we, ha we have gained through our research we uh, plan and uh, design courses for the teachers in prison education so that their uh, knowledge also will be more research based and more uh, detailed to the prison population's uh, needs. And also, uh, uh, we also have a continuous political focus on education in prison in, uh, in Norway. So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for um, that great presentation. And our final speaker um, comes to us today from Italy, and that's Massimiliano Schirinzi, and he will talk about the chapter that he and his co-authors contributed on immigration. Oh, okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the space you dedicated me. And I want to start thank, uh, saying thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to participate in all this uh, um, spacious and grand project. Talking about um, prison and education in prison is a great opportunity for us. Um, I want to say thank you, Justin, all the orders and all the um, collaboration we received during the um, the work we have done in this month. Um, I want to start uh, from uh, a couple of slides I prepared. Um, I don't know where um, is my... Uh, yes. Uh, I don't find my uh, slides at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. 
I don't have my slides with me, for instance. Uh, could you please send a... Okay, I want to... I'll start talking about, and then if you help me with my slides, because I uh, don't find my computer. So, um, our... Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, our um, chapter titled Rethinking Education and Mediation for Incarcerated Immigrants in Italy um, focuses mainly on the reality of uh, Italian prisons and educations. Um, during over the years, uh, our um, uh, reality in prisons has had lots of changes. Uh, up to the 1975, uh, uh, the uh, main idea of the prison has changed, passing uh, by from uh, the possibility that the punishment was intended before the 1975 into the uh, uh, rehabilitation. Um, could you go on, please? Um, okay, could you tap? Okay. Um, for, for instance, um, intended any uh, incarcerated person as an individual, it was thought that any individual had to receive uh, the right education also in prison, starting from programs who um, developed uh, education from the primary school until the university. Nowadays, we uh, can uh, have all over the, um, our territory in uh, Italy many um, uh, faculties who teach in prison. So um, people incarcerated uh, within the uh, prison could follow, of course, many uh, of um, um, courses that uh, our university, Italian University, offer. Um, mainly, uh, the main problem is uh, uh, that not all the uh, institutions could have uh, the same possibility for the incarcerated people since they um, need to uh, study through tutors who uh, will uh, accompany the students during the uh, entire path of studying. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, in prison um, are offered also literacy courses for uh, the uh, not Italian speakers. Um, as we uh, we are the main uh, uh, point of disembarkment for migrants, we have a very uh, high number of um, prisoners for uh, incarcerated people because once the uh, can I have the second uh, the next one please okay um unfortunately uh the high number of uh, incarcerated migrants um overcrowded prison at the beginning of January 2023 the incarcerated migrants uh were around the 31 0.5%. It means that uh, they don't uh, enjoy the uh, right care they use to um, receive. First, because they lost the lack of the language. They don't uh, have the uh, proper language um, to uh, um, stay within the prison to have contact among the prisons. And very often they don't um, uh, speak any uh, 
language or any dialect do, they can um, contact together among the prisoners. Um, this is the main aspect who uh, touch the, um, uh, the, the Italian prison since they receive, they should receive our first literacy courses in Italian, but the main problem uh, is the absence of mediators. Uh, the uh, uh, linguistic mediators who are the people who uh, intervene immediately since from the disembark to the trials and quite often they don't um, can help the uh, people immigrants who uh, arrive to the uh, jail um, it's a uh, it determines of course a great um trouble for the um, immigrants since they cannot have any contact with familiars any um, sometimes quite often they don't understand why they are in prison and um, especially they have to spend the time until the trial waiting uh for uh, the time to be sentenced but uh, of course they ask themselves why very often uh, the the main aspect is the cultural uh, and uh, the cultural aspect because um since they arrive to the um, institutions without uh, knowing why they are in the in jail because uh, the uh, safety decrease, the first and the second, they um, changed a lot the life uh, of uh, migrants in order to ask also for a residence permission. Um, and since they arrived to the territory, they become um, one of the basins uh, for the uh, criminal criminalization, since they are not uh, um, safety, uh, they uh, are surrounded by biases. For this reason, um, it should be uh, um, necessary uh, a chance to offer them um, the possibility to learn the language, learn in this case Italian. Uh, to uh, keep in touch with the familiar or keep in touch or have contact uh, also with the um, prison staff and quite often it doesn't happen. Uh, this is the reason why um, the figure of mediator, intercultural mediator and linguistic mediator should be a mandatory to um, uh, we make them uh, sure to enjoy a uh, um, possibility to have clarif clarification and also the chance to obtain uh, uh, the right they uh, deserve. This is uh, everything for the time. <clears throat> I want to say. Thank you to my other uh, co-authors, uh, 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 Maria Garro and uh, Giacchino uh, Lavanco. They are uh, Giacchino is the head department. Maria Garro is a professor of psychology, and Michelangelo Capitano uh, is a uh, um, chief of the juvenile prison. Uh, now is retired. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Massimiliano. Um, we have uh, a few minutes for questions, or I, I, we would have a few minutes for questions, but I'm going to roll the questions and the final sort of statements um, from each presenter into one. Um, so in the, in, the, in the last few minutes, if, what we could do is we'll go through the same order, um, Jennifer and then Manisha and then Lisa and then Massimiliano. Um, and if you would sort of distill it for us, break it down and tell us what is one thing that you hope your chapter can offer to others who read it um, 
And then um, one area in your country, in your context, one area for growth that you would like to see education in prison move into. So again, we'll start with Jennifer. If you could, if if the, the panelists could talk about um, one thing that they think their um, context can offer and then one uh, challenge still yet to overcome. Thanks, uh, I'll, start, I'll, I'll start by the challenge. I think that one of the challenge that it's not only education in prison, but education in general has to do with um, much uh, to really thinking about quality of education. What does that mean? Um, we tend to have a very traditional way of teaching, of education, of looking, writing, copying what's on the book, not necessarily much dialogue. And then again, when I talked about the similarities between prison the school outside and the communities, we, we see the same thing. So for me, one of the challenge would be to really think about and move a step ahead in terms of quality of ed education, critical thinking, and uh, yeah, and, and, and having a much more uh, sense of dialogue in, in educational spaces. Uh, so definitely one of, that's one of the challenge. And, and another challenge, I guess, is also to to think in a much more systemic level, like there are a number of civil society organizations working inside the centers at the lack of uh, programs provided by the state or provided by the same uh, detention centers. So recognizing that uh, the work that civil society organizations do in terms of education needs to be taken into, into public policy strategies that will make sustainable changes. Um, so those are the two things that I will say. Um, and in terms of what I hope my chapter would provide to larger audiences, I think I'll also think about in two levels. The first one is to 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 know or to realize that the power writing is incredible, not just for the person, but also to build on communities and there shouldn't be any educational programs without a creative writing component that explore the self and the self in relationship to others. So that's one of the things that I like to leave um, to audiences. And the second thing I think is to, it goes back to this very systemic view. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves as implementers or as people that are interested in contributing to the system is, do we wanna do an isolated project that's gonna be great, that that's gonna be amazing? Or do we wanna think in a more strategic level and it's not one thing after, or next to the or after the other, it's perhaps as we did it, we started by a small program that then be, that had a vision of becoming something much more strategic. So I'll say never to, to leave that, that vision behind even though you don't start there. Thank you, Manisha. Thank you. There are so many challenges to the work that we do and that has so many challenges that the authors identify throughout this edited volume. Uh, I think at its core, one massive challenge that uh, that we face in the United States and that may be shared across some some of the cases are issues of white supremacy, of uh, systems of racially encoded social hierarchy more broadly that are uh, deeply perpetuated at every level of society from our pre-K through 12 public school curricula, for example, um, to, to the political rhetoric that we're immersed in. And so I, I think that the degree of fundamental culture change that has to happen to help education in prison be, be valued is substantial. Uh, it's also something that is possible. And I do, I do stay hopeful because I, as a, as a comparative political scientist, I look at uh, the, the, history of politics and I see the way that things change over time. So I, I think that we're capable of addressing unequal social systems and figuring out how to ha how to correct them. At the same time, that culture change requires rethinking this concept of public safety, rethinking retributive justice or punitive justice 
to, to an entirely different kind of system. And again, I'm encouraged because I, I think the discourse in the US around things like um, community policing and the way that the the way that security is operating on college campuses, for example, or within public school systems within uh, different kinds of communities, is on people's minds. It's being discussed. There are interventions and and social experiments that are happening in real time. Um, and uh, and just to end, I think another thing I I am hopeful about is that we'll continue to differentiate prison education, which in my mind is the education that correctional systems create for people in their custody versus education in prison, which is what many of us in this volume are talking about bringing outside conceptions of education into inside spaces. And there's a lot of conflation between those terms. And I think that there's something really beautiful about starting to differentiate them and focus our, our energy on the the kind of dignity and self-transformation that outside programs can uh, can bring into carceral spaces. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mimi Shen. Dr. Jones? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, in our chapter, the main thing is the, to, to see this collaboration between us as researchers and the uh, governor administrators and how this um, um, work and collaboration can um, gain the correctional uh, services and um, moreover how this getting as a research-based knowledge how that's so important for giving the incarcerated adults uh, education in line with their needs and um, wishes and again building mastery experiences and prepare for a life after uh, the challenges in Norway, we have a good, we have, as I said, uh, education offered in all prisons and a legal right to complete upper secondary education. But we really do have uh, <laughs> barriers facing the um, um, the access to higher education. So that is something uh, we are working uh, on and uh, in an area that really needs to be done something with. Mm. Great. Thank you so much. And finally, one minute, Massimiliano. Yes, now the audio. Uh, the main challenge um, in Italy is, uh, first of all, thinking a uh, broad education that starts within the sc schools and from the primary to the university, and then uh, um, uh, over an overcoming of biases from that it would be possible to reach a uh, prison and uh, take within the prison the right path, educational path, thinking about literacy courses, uh, vocational courses, and then uh, it would be a, a real education that could um, transform the mentality and then the citizen. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Thank you for the panelists um, who gave their time and zoomed in from all over the world. Um, thank you to the Clow Institute and the Nativic Institute and the Center for Social Concerns for hosting this. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, again, the book itself will be out in January of 24, so hopefully soon um, we'll be able to pass out information about how to pre-order it. Um, and I'll just leave us with one note really quickly, is that this project actually started as trying to um, have a comparative look at higher education in prison, college in prison, essentially. Um, and we, the more we contacted people in this field around the world, um, the more we found that it didn't exist in a lot of places. Uh, and so we sort of pressed and, and asked why. And sometimes the answer was, we don't have enough people in prison long enough. Um, and so it's a, in some ways, it's a unique American um, uh, institution of having people in prison so long that they can go to college. Um, and so that's something that we continue to wrestle with as practitioners. Um, so on that note, thank you again to everyone for coming and we really appreciate it. And hopefully you take something away and um, take care.